Hi, Chris Potts here. This is the fourth in our series of screencasts on semantic composition. The first three screencasts covered technical preliminaries and built up our semantic lexicon. This screencast is going to put all those pieces together in a single compositional grammar for a small fragment of English. So clearly I'll be presupposing the first three screencasts throughout this screencast. We're going to jump directly to section five of our handout semantic grammar. And it's nice to step back and see that the whole grammar fits here on this single page. You can think of the lexicon as the raw ingredients and the rules presented here combine those ingredients into complex meanings. And the rules will tell you what to do with every subtree that you'll encounter in the fragment of English that we can interpret, and the instruction is always unambiguous. Our most basic rule is lex, uh, for lexical. It just says that if you're at the leaf nodes in the tree, the ones with no children, then you get the meaning of the node by retrieving it directly from the semantic lexicon. The rule NB is pretty basic too. It's called NB for non-branching. Uh, and it says that if you see a non-branching node in the syntax, you should just pass up the meaning of the child to its parent. And this is a kind of bookkeeping rule. You're just passing up the meaning unmodified. In principle, semantically, this rule could be dispensed with since it has no impact on the overall meaning. Uh, but we keep it here because syntacticians have lots of these non-branching uh, structures in their trees, and we want to be able to honor what they give us. Hence rule NB. Our rule S is more interesting. It's called S because it represents the most basic way of obtaining a sentence meaning from a proper name, a PN, and a verb phrase, a VP. And the semantic part of this rule says that just assess whether the meaning of the PN is a member of the meaning of the VP. If it is, then the S node's meaning is true, otherwise it's false. Our next rule is A for adjective. It explains how to handle adjectival modifiers of NPs. And this rule is just doing function application in the only way it can be done given the child nodes involved. We know from the lexicon that adjectives are functions from sets to sets, and this NP is definitely gonna denote a set. So we apply the AP meaning to the NP meaning. Uh, in the rule, we have these annotations i and j on the NPs to distinguish them. The lower NP, subscript i, is the argument, and we produce NP sub j. And this is actually key to the recursive adjectival modification we can get in the syntax, and you can see that our semantics is prepared for such stacking of modifiers as well. Rule n for negation. This is a bit of a hack. We just assume that the negation is kind of tacked on to the VP and it acts as, a, acts as a functor on the VP. I think the syntacticians wouldn't like these structures. They would favor a full theory of adverbs, uh, but this simple treatment works and it's fine in terms of compositionality, so let's call it good. Uh, and we again have subscripts to distinguish the two VPs. And this too actually creates the possibility of stacking up these nevers if indeed the syntax will allow it. Next up is rule TV. Uh, it too derives VP meanings. Here TV stands for transitive verb. And the rule says that transitive verb meanings apply to the PN object semantically. And the result is a set of entities, just like both of the VP nodes that we see in rule N and the VP node in rule S. Finally, we have two rules for handling quantificational determiners since they have two arguments. Rule Q1 says that a determiner D takes its restriction as an argument semantically. And rule Q2 says that the output of Q1 applies to the VP to create the overall meaning of the sentence. So we now have in our grammar two ways of creating S meanings. Notice that they differ semantically. For rule S, we assert membership. And for rule Q2, we apply a function to an argument. We also have two ways of creating VPs and they're potentially interconnected. For instance, I can use rule TV to create a VP node and then rule n can negate it. And of course, rule n is also happy to take simple and transitive VPs like studies as its lower VP, that is VP sub i. In other words, as I've noted before, a transitive verb with its object argument is just like an intransitive verb semantically. Let's now walk through a few derivations aimed at showing how the grammar rules work together. And we'll start with the simple sentence BART skateboards. So we'll use the grammar to interpret it compositionally. Every node will have an independent meaning, and that meaning will either come from the lexicon in the case of leaf nodes, or else be derived from it by its children according to a grammar rule. So we start with the meaning of skateboards. Rule lex says look it up, 
and rule nb tells us how to handle this non-branching structure here. The non-branching structure matches the rule's syntactic template, and this tells us what to do meaning-wise. In the syntax, we have one more non-branching structure here, so we again use rule nb and rule lex. And here to reveal more of what's happening, I unpack the meaning of skateboard into a set. So we're operating under the assumption that the skateboarders are just Bart and Homer. And now we process the subject. We begin with Bart. Rule NB tells us to pass him up unmodified because we again match NB's template. And finally, we get to use a new rule, rule S. The matching is triggered by the S node branching to PN and VP. And notice that we can't use rule Q2, which would require a QP as its left argument. So only rule S applies. And on the meaning side, rule S says, assess whether PN meaning is a member of VP meaning. So we do that. And we can further reduce this by evaluating the set theory statement, and that takes us all the way to the final value, which happens to be true. Let's do scholarly student now. We use rule lex and NB to build all the way up to the smaller tree with NP at its root and children A, P, and NP. This triggers the use of rule A, and that involves applying the meaning of the AP to the meaning of the NP. And then we can do the lambda conversion and some other simplifications as I've done, continuing to work upwards. And we get the set containing just Lisa as the meaning for scholarly child. Let's do a transitive verb case. And this too will involve function application. We use lex and nb to get to the top with the tree rooted at vp and children v and pn. Then the, the v meaning applies to the pn meaning. And we sort of look that one up in the meaning of teases and we ultimately derive the set containing Homer and Lisa the set of entities that tease Bart. Let's move now to 40. This continues building up from 39 to form the sentence Maggie teases Bart. This is compositional semantics, and we already derived teases Bart, and we know that won't change, so we can just proceed from there. In this case, the subtree with root S and children PN and VP triggers an application of rule S. And so we just do an evaluation of set membership, and the result of all this is F, since Maggie doesn't te tease Bart or anyone else. Final example, we start with every child skateboards in the syntax. We have to apply rules lex and nb a bunch of times to proceed with the non-branching nodes. Uh, here I've done all those steps. And the only noteworthy thing is that I also unpack the meaning of every since we want to see how it functions as the primary piece of the composition. We first put together the determiner every with its restriction child. That's an application of q1. Intuitively, what happens is that the meaning of child knocks out the lambda x in every and goes in for x in the body of that expression, which delivers the entire meaning of the subject, every child. Finally, we use rule q2 to get the sentence meaning because we match its template syntactically. The subject meaning is the functor. It applies to the vp meaning for skateboards, which knocks out the lambda y, and skateboard goes in for the variable y in the body of the expression which delivers this final expression here. And notice that this is just saying that we have a value of true if the children are a subset of the set of skateboarders. So we've derived the final meaning, which corresponds to a claim about the world, as we would expect given our intuitions about the sentence we're analyzing and the little possible world that we created. The rest of the handout offers some more example syntactic structures that you can interpret. Working on them is a great way to get a better feel for this kind of analysis and prepare for the assignment work. Another good strategy is to work with the Python code to check out your answers and explore the concepts in a more automated way.